Hi, I'm going to talk through these and I think that they're the same as a textbook. So between the two editions, sometimes the textbook version doesn't exist, but if you were having trouble following in class, this is another way to study. It's just kind of walk back through. So your homework is to answer this question, many professional schools require applicants to take a standardized test. Suppose that a thousand took the test. Several weeks later, Pete got his score. He got a 63. This put him in the 93rd percentile. So, if I was trying to answer this question and I wasn't sure if I'd get full credit, I would do um, the types of things that we did in class to show our work. So, question 2.1. We're supposing it's a standardized test and we're not sure based on what they told us, but it sounds like he's in the 73rd percentile. So that means the area to the left of his curve is 0.73 if the area under the curve is one. That's what all that means. It also means Pete did at or better, if there was 100 people that took the test, at or better, 73 people. There was 1,000 people, so it's, he did, or excuse me, at or below. He did at or below 730 people. He was at or below 730 people out of the 1,000 people. So a couple ways they could ask it, but essentially I think the students in class found Pete did the same or better than about 73% of test takers. And that's what the picture shows. Um, so these are the people that did better than him. So if his score is right here, notice he did better than this person that got this score, better than this person that got this score. Hopefully that makes sense. So the answer is E. Now let's go to the next question. So question two, this one was a little bit trickier in class. So again, if I sketch the curve, I can get some partial points, even if I don't get this question right on the multiple choice. I can get most all my points. So it looks like uh, it goes from negative eight to positive 12, okay? And it does say it's normally distributed, okay. So it looks like the number in the middle is two and they're asking what would be the standard deviation? So most of the time our calculator does that work. So you might be asking, well, my dis distribution ranges from negative eight to two, 12, negative eight all the way up to 12. So it's a range of 20 numbers. So this data shows a range of 20 numbers, right? And using our flip chart here, we might say to ourselves, okay, well, this is, this is one standard deviation. Oh, this is, somebody took my flip chart. That's the ugly one. There we go. So this is from mu to mu plus one. So this is the width of one standard deviation. That's the width of two standard deviations. Mu plus two standard deviations is right there. Mu plus three standard deviations. So if we look at this, there's most, it looks like six strips of data or three standard deviations to the left and the right are pretty much all our data. If we look at this, this is actually hardly any data at all. So in a way, it's kind of exaggerated. This area is 0.15%, tiny, tiny. You probably couldn't even see that area. And this area is 0.15%. So if we think about that, almost all of our data, 99.7% of our data is within three standard deviations or six strips. Okay. So to figure out what my standard deviation is just by hand, I can think I have to cut this 20 into six strips. So 
So 20 divided by six is 3.3. .3. So it said it is the closest to. So when I look at my choices, that's the closest to D. So it's still an approximation. Let's say you thought, well, I had four strips to the right and four strips to the left. So if you divided that by eight, 20 divided by eight, you get 2.5. So if you did 20 divided by eight, you still get 2.5. And if you round up, you get three. So depending on how you approximate, the number three is still closest to the two ways you could have approximated. All right, let's do number three. Give me a second just to adjust my camera. Okay. So number three says, the rainwater was collected in 30 different sites. The amount of acidity was measured. The mean and the standard deviation is 4.60 and 1.1. So we know that this is what it looks like. So this would be 4.60 plus 1.1. 4.060 minus 1.1. Now it says, if it was recalibrated, they actually found it was an error. The error can be corrected by adding 0.1 to all the units. So we can just do that manually. Oops, we're gonna fix it. So if we fix it, the new labels on our picture are 4.7. Three point six and five point eight. Okay. Now it says, oh, but the error didn't just include adding all of these values. We also need to multiply 1.1. 1 .1. Okay. So there would be a data point. We can think of this as a data point. There would be such a data point where that data point, this is a drop of water that was measured originally at 4.6 with the bad machine or 4.6 plus 1.1. One, one. So that would be 4.7 or five, excuse me, 5.7, right? And this would be a little bit lower than that. So 4.6 minus one, one. So these were actual data points. And again, we're supposed to take our actual data and recalibrate it by adding the 1.1, but then also multiplying by 1.2. Okay. So it looks like my mean value, I can already eliminate C and D. Okay, and then this is one standard deviation above the mean. This is one standard deviation below the mean. But let's figure out how much the standard deviation actually changed. So if I compare these two numbers, that's one standard deviation above the mean. So if I take 6.96 and subtract it from 5.64, I can find out how much did my standard deviation, how much, what is my standard deviation now? Ah, it's 1.32. So after this change, my stand, I'm gonna pick B, my standard deviation definitely changed by this amount. So you could have also done it another way. You knew before your standard deviation was 1.1. When we add anything to the standard deviation, it doesn't change. So adding in our notes, 
adding doesn't change the standard deviation. Um, but when we multiply, it does change. So the 1.1 standard deviation now got multiplied by 1.2. Mm, yep, and that's how we got this new value of standard deviation. Now, kind of like our pumpkin example, we can think of it as just how would the raw data change? And then after the fact, figure out what did you observe? I observed that the standard deviation changed by this, or we can try to use our notes. Either way should work. All right, next question. So 2.4 is what I call the cheater graph. So it looks like figure out the cumulative frequency consumed in a sample of 150 adults. So they talked to 150 adults, One, somebody consumed nothing. Somebody consumed all the way up to 18 ounces and everywhere in between. So that's our max and our min. Now let's figure out, they wanna us to say about what percent of these consumed between four and eight. So when I look on the graph, it looks like four lines up with 20 and it looks like eight lines up with 60. So by the time we talked to all the people, if we line them up in order from least consumed to most consumed, by the time we have talked to all of these consumers, all these adults, and I got to consuming four ounces, I had talked to 20% of the people. And then by the time I talked to the people that consume eight ounces, I'd talked to 60% of the people. So that should make sense. The amount of people between these two should be 40%. 40% of these 150 adults consume between four and eight. And we're reading that right from the chart. That's why it's called a cheater graph. Thanks for joining me. Check out the next video.